Good morning, everyone. I want to invite you to stand as we sing and worship our God this morning. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Welcome, everyone. We're glad that you are here. If you're visiting with us, uh, you're a blessing to us this morning. We'd love for you to fill out a visitor's card. They're on the back of the pew in front of you. Let us know on that card how we can be of service to you. And as you exit through the lobby this morning, please place that card in the collection plate. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, we love you. We miss you. Uh, give us a click or a comment uh, on that page to let us know that you are with us. Uh, be sure to check and recheck your e-bulletin for all of the latest updates about our loved ones and their prayer request, as well as our church activities. One I'll just briefly highlight. Um, if you want to uh, participate in the Joy Box program with Hope for Haiti Children, we've already met our 80 that we committed to do, but now we can do even more. And so if you want to get in on that action, uh, see the folks in the lobby. They'll hook you up with a joy box that you'll fill up with prescribed items and return back to this building on September the 25th so the kids in Haiti get those joy boxes by Christmas time. We are a church who believes Jesus is all to us. And let's sing about that sentiment in this next song. Precious cornerstone, sure foundation, you are faithful to the end. We are waiting on you, Jesus. 
us, we believe your all to us. Only Son of God, sent from heaven, hope and mercy at the cross. You are everything, you're the promise. Jesus, you Our brother Ray is going to come now and lead us in the scripture reading and prayer. That's what I call service. This, the reading this morning on the board is going to be Daniel chapter 6, verse 1 through 5. But ahead of that, we're changing governments. The Babylonians have been in charge of the Israelites for many, many years. And Belshazzar was the last one, and he found a writing on the wall that said, your time's up, bud. And then we start here in chapter 6 with Darius. And Darius is a uh, leader from the uh, Medes and Persians. And as you read longer, you'll find he was a great benefit to the Israelite people in going back home. It pleased Darius to support 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to, to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators that the, and the satraps by his exceptional duties, qualities, that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charging him unless it has something to do with his God. Would you bow with me, please? Father God in heaven, as we read in your book of governments coming and going, 
and how mis they mistreated your people. Father, we're thankful that others looked out for your people and allowed them to go back to Israel. Father, today we see much conflict and troubles both in our country and throughout the world. Father, we would pray that your hand will be upon those of authority, that they will enact laws and do things that will be beneficial to all people here and elsewhere. Father God, we thank you for this church. We thank you for the effort that's been made to keep it open and going and growing during this time of dilemma. We pray, Father, that uh, you'll continue to bless the country to rid itself of that uh, terrible plague. Father God, please watch over each one of us today. Bless us for being here. We pray, Father, you'll bless each one that participates. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning again, church. I have uh, joining me on stage this morning, uh, Jason Person. Uh, Jason and his family uh, became members of our church family back when he was 13 years old. He graduated this past spring from North Greenville University with degrees in history and business administration. And uh, Jason and his fiance, Joel, are headed to Mexico in September on a seven month mission trip. So Jason, I want you to tell the church when and why you became interested in doing foreign mission work. Whenever I was in college, one of my friends, his name was Matthew Basha. He invited me to go to Indonesia with him and his parents are long-term missionaries in Indonesia through the International Mission Board. And so he invited me to go out there and spend time with him and his family. And whenever I was there, it was a very long plane ride and I really enjoyed witnessing new culture. But we went door to door for evangelism and also visited people in the underground church there. If you don't know anything about Indonesia, it is the biggest concentration of Muslims in the world. But the island we were on was Bali, was predominantly Hindu. So we were talking and meeting people who have never heard the name of Jesus Christ. And I remember just being astounded, knowing that people have never heard the name. And here in, in church, we always get to hear Jesus and talk about him freely. But there, you're going to be casted out from your family if you become a Christian. So I recognize that there's a need for people all over the world that have never heard the gospel or know who Jesus is. And we should bring it to them. So that's maybe about three years ago when you started studying apologetics and a philosophy. Tell everybody why you started doing that. It was a culmination of a lot of things. I was working an office job, so I had a lot of time to think. Um, I was pretty far away from all of my friends, and I felt pretty isolated. So naturally, when I'm doing computer work, I just ask a lot of deep questions. I'm asking, how I, can I defend my faith with other people whenever they bring accusations against Christianity? Uh, I recognize that a lot of people that grow up in the church, they're not really taught how to defend their faith. And so whenever they get to college or a place where people have different worldviews than them, it just seems to crumble and fall apart. And I'd like to be able to help, you know, younger kids and college people that are Christians to help defend their faith. And also point to a creator by using things like reason, logic, and philosophy. So also about three years ago, you got interested in climbing. And the picture on the board is a picture of your first completed climb. Uh, what sparked your interest? And um, please explain why you love hanging off the side of mountains. <laughs> I originally started playing, started climbing because I had a fear of heights and you know most people that have a fear of heights you should never start climbing because you'll be paralyzed with fear but it was the exact opposite for me. I went to a gym with my friend Riley and I recognized how strenuous it is on the body and I enjoy athletics so you know climbing was just perfect for me. I'm up in the mountains, there's walls all around you can climb and I've recognized that climbing I can use it as an act of worship by exploring God's creation. And he showed me this ministry in Mexico where I can forge relationships with other people and take every opportunity to share the gospel with people. Um, in Mexico, we have a lot of people that come from Europe and places like Denmark and Germany. They're more atheistic, so I can share the need for a creator using reason, logic, and philosophy, and also be able to enjoy spending time with people who aren't just like I am. So all I can say is your poor mom uh, about your, your climbing. But I, I do love how God has uh, combined your, uh, your love for sharing the gospel with your love for climbing. And you started talking a little bit about uh, your trip to Mexico uh, last year where climbers from all over the world come and it serves as an opportunity uh, for you to spend time with them and to share the gospel with them. 
I, I want to go to um, what you summarized with me the other day uh, in terms of your two uh, uh, phrases you used to describe what you did in Mexico last year and what you're going to do this year. Um, one was planting seed ministry and two was alleviating early church trauma. So give us an example of each one of those. Earlier on in the season, I met a guy from Germany. His name was Kai. He's from Cologne, Germany. And the first day I met him, we ended up having a three and a half hour conversation about atheism and Christianity. He's from Cologne, Germany. So it used to be a really predominantly Catholic area of Europe, but it was ousted in recent years. And so the predominant belief there is atheism. So we had really fruitful conversations over the course of three and a half hours. And we were both talking about, you know, the need for morality and why there's a creator. Uh, we talked about the differences between Christianity and Catholicism. Most people don't know there's, a, you know there's some certain differences between those two. And the picture of Catholicism that they have in Europe, after a lot of church trauma throughout the Middle Ages, we were always able to clear some of those misconceptions up with Christianity and Catholicism. So that was really awesome, spending time with Kai. So that's an example of planting seed ministry, yes. right? Give an example of the early church trauma that you try to alleviate. I'd say the majority of people that come to Mexico, they have some sort of church trauma. They're all pretty, <clears throat> they're well versed in Christianity, but something happened when they were younger where they don't want to go back to the church, whether that's they were mistreated in the church or whether they just had a bad taste in their mouth or they felt like church is a bunch of hypocrites. Uh, I have a friend named Gloria. She's from Quebec, Canada. And I was spending a lot of time with her. We were climbing and doing multi-pitch climbs. And one day we were talking about Christianity. <clears throat> and she opened up to me saying why she doesn't go back to church. Her father was a pastor the majority of her life. And almost all of her childhood, he was molesting her. But yet he'd show up to church on Sunday and share the gospel with people. And so the fact that she endured so much trauma throughout her younger years, I could just see the weight that she was carrying around. And she connected all of that way with Jesus Christ. And the fact that I was able to remain patient and calm with the Holy Spirit throughout such an uncomfortable time period of you know, talking to her about this conversation, I was able to let her know that we can't put our faith in other people and other humans are always gonna let us down. But if we put our faith in Christ and pursue him rather than people, we'll be fulfilled and we're never gonna be alone. So you are halfway to raising the recommended funding for your seven-month uh, trip to Mexico, and the funds cover his rent, his travel expenses, basic living expenses, and uh, what you need to actually do ministry there. Uh, so how can people help you if, if they're interested in doing so? Um, currently, right now, I'm halfway to getting supported. So financially is also a really big thing for missionaries in Mexico. The cafe that I serve at, Almost all of our proceeds go to a nonprofit Christian school that we built in the area. And so we're support raised in everything we work for. We go there and live off of, and we donate to the cafe, which gives all the money to the school. Um, you can go on climbersforchrist.com slash give. You can select my name under purpose and give for that. You can give a one-time gift or a reoccurring donation. Because it's a not-for-profit, everything's tax deductible. I need a lot of prayer for my trip in Mexico. You know, you're always having open-ended conversations with people who don't necessarily like Christianity. So just pray that I can share the gospel with love, care, and grace with them, and encouragement as well. Whenever you're really far away from friends, family, and your church, you can feel pretty isolated and sad and lonely. So if you guys could send me uh, emails or things in the mail, that would be awesome. Well, Jason, we are really, really proud of you and to, to see you, the way in which the Lord is writing his story in your life to share the gospel. Uh, we love you. Uh, Jason will be in the foyer at the end of uh, service today if you want to talk to him about his mission. But why don't we pray for Jason right now? Lord God, thank you for bringing into Jason's heart the love of Christ. And we pray, God, that as he seeks to share your gospel in, in difficult environments, that, God, you will, by your spirit, grant him the words and the actions necessary to do so. 
uh, continue to fill his life and Joel's with peace and joy and righteousness in the Holy Spirit as they team God uh, to serve in your kingdom. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody thank Jason for sharing with us this morning. Our brother Brent Cassell is going to lead us um, as we celebrate the Lord's Supper together in just a moment. Before that, let's sing this song, Lamb of God. So I'm helping my family build something, which happens all the time. I never seem to ever stop building something. And sometimes we recruit people with us because the projects get too big. So we had one of our friends named Mike. And Mike is amazing to watch work with his hands. And he's so quick, and he's so quick. And then I noticed that he's bleeding. And I asked my father-in-law, like, does this happen a lot? He's like, Mike goes too fast all the time. If he works, he bleeds. Yeah. And we had this, you know, we're using the wood to kind of like finish off this project. And, you know, his blood's like all over this one piece of wood. And lo and behold, that's the one we use at the top of the door frame. <laughs> what does that make you think about? Biblically, Exodus chapter 12, verse 7. And they're to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames of the house where they eat the lambs. What you would put on your door frame so the badness and the sin wouldn't claim you at that particular time for Israel. And it's just kind of a, a visual presentation that I think of because I see that door frame now and I think, well, there's Mike's blood and it's always going to be up, up there. And we kind of joked about that, like Mike's always going to be a part of this house. And we don't always think about God always being a part of us as a building or a temple. That no matter where we go or which door that we are walking through, that He's on the sides, and he's on the top of the door frame as well, protecting us from the things that could happen to us, washing away the things that definitely could 
blemish us. Different things to think about as we now partake of the bread. Father God, we thank you for all the things you do for us. We are glad that we are a, a building created in your image and that we also get to identify with the building in the body that is Jesus Christ. Let us remember that as we partake of this bread at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue. Father God, we thank you for the fact that you have washed us in blood just like that door frame and that you continue to keep us from harm and also to, to take away our sins and to take away the bad that is in our life. Let us always be reminded of the door frame that uh, we are and can be because of sacrifices made for us by another. And it's in Jesus' name we, we pray for the fruit of the vine at this time. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brent. That was a beautiful analogy there. Let's, uh, let's all sing this song together. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah.
the earth and sky, all ye fruitful trees and cedars, all ye hills and mountains high, creeping things and beasts and cattle, birds that in the Princes, great earth judges all. Praise his name, young men and maidens, aged men and children small. Let them praise his give Jehovah, for his name alone is high, and his glory is exalted. And his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. It is now time for youth Bible classes to begin. So if you're between the ages of two and high school, you may go with this time. And for everyone else, Let's sing them out with song. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. All right, Jay is going to speak to us in just a moment. Um, before that, let's sing one, one more song, Living Hope. And I want to invite you to stand for this one. <clears throat> How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain. I could not climb in desperation. I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. has spoken, I am forgiven, the King of Kings calls me his own, beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my
that seal the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, your be seated. During the first half of Mark's gospel, the apostles must have felt like they were riding on a speedboat as Jesus casts out demons, gives sight to the blind, and outsmarts religious scholars. But in the second half of Mark's gospel, Jesus clearly tells them that they are in fact riding on the Titanic and not a speedboat. They're headed to Jerusalem, where Jesus will be arrested, where Jesus will be brutalized and ultimately crucified. Nevertheless, the apostles didn't buy it. They were convinced that Israel was going to be an independent nation and Jesus was going to be coronated as king in Jerusalem. And they were certain that if the forces of evil would get in Jesus' way, Jesus would kick them to the curb with his great power. Now, in Mark chapter 3, two of Jesus' apostles, James and John, are introduced to us as the sons of thunder. Jesus gave them that nickname in Luke chapter 9. James and John, probably like every other Jew in that day, hated Samaritans. It must have appalled them when they noticed Jesus talking to a Samaritan woman in John chapter 4 the first person he ever clearly told that he was, in fact, the Messiah. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus and his apostles are traveling through a Samaritan village who don't treat them very kindly, and that's where Jesus gives James and John their nickname. Now, in the scene you're about to see from season 2 of The Chosen, uh, there is some embellishment around the scene in Luke chapter 9. Jesus has instructed James and John previously to this, to plow the field of a Samaritan man named Malik. And then what happens following is how these two got their nickname. Take a look. Rabbi, ah, you couldn't wait, could you? We're sorry, we just uh, wanted to clear a few things up, if that's okay. By all means. You Jewish boys are far from home. Yes, as a matter of fact, we are. Shalom to you, too. Here's our traditional Jewish greeting for you. Don't lift a finger. That was a warning. Try it again and see what happens. Quiet, Big James. Shalom to you, too. <gasps> you filthy dogs! I said quiet. Let us do something. What would that achieve? Defending your honor. They reviled and humiliated you. They deserve to have bolts of lightning rain out and incinerate them. Yes, fire from the heavens. Fire? You said we could do things like that. Say the word and it will happen. Why not? We knew we couldn't trust these people. We shouldn't have come here in the first place. They don't deserve you. Why do you think I had you work Melek's field? What was I trying to teach you? To help? You think it was just to be more helpful? Or to be better farmers? It was to show you that what we're doing here, 
will last for generations. What I told Fotina at the well, and what she then told so many others, it's sowing seeds that will have a lasting impact for lifetimes. Can you not see what's happening here? These people that you hate so much are believing in me without even seeing miracles. It's the message, the truth that we're giving them. And you're going to get in the way of that because a few people from a region you don't like were mean to you. That they're not worthy? What, you're so much better? You're more worthy? Well, let me tell you something. You're not. That's the whole point. It's why I'm here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Rabbi. As we gather others, I need you to help show the way. To be humble. We will. You wanted to use the power of God to bring down fire, to burn these people up? Well, it sounds a lot worse when you say it that way. <laughs> you too. You're like a storm on the sea. Come on. Thunder exploding out of your chests at every turn. <laughs> In fact, that's what I'm going to call you from now on. James and John, the sons of thunder. You know, who can blame James and John for thinking the, the power that Jesus possessed should be used to overwhelm their enemies and to establish his kingdom, right? I mean, that is how the world works. The strongest rule, the strongest survive. And so certainly they expected Jesus to wield his strength as a way to, to win and for good to ultimately triumph. And so they were sure Jesus would, when push came to shove in Jerusalem, overpower his way to the throne if need be. Now in Mark chapter 10, James and John, as Jesus and the apostles are drawing closer to Jerusalem, for this final showdown with the religious establishment and the Roman forces, pull Jesus aside to have a private conversation with him. And as they do, and as we read this conversation this morning, we'll see how two worlds and two kingdoms collide. So hear this word from the Lord in Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink? or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve 
and give his life as a ransom for many. I want you to focus with me on that last statement in verse 45, where Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man. That description had a dual meaning, the more common of which was simply referring to Jesus' humanity. Anyone who was human was a son or daughter of man. But that phrase also had a secondary meaning that the religious scholars were very familiar with. The phrase can be found back in Daniel 7 where there is this famous prophecy related to the Son of Man who will enter the presence of God, thereby making himself God and rule from heaven over an eternal kingdom. It's that Son of Man that everyone in this time was expecting to come and win the day for the Jewish people over the Roman powers that be. So when Jesus uses the phrase Son of Man, he is claiming divine authority. For instance, if you go back to Mark chapter 3, before Jesus healed a paralyzed man, before his critics, he said, so that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, I say to him, get up and walk. And so this phrase, Son of Man, is describing who God, in fact, is. When Jesus says, for the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. In Greek mythology, Zeus and Hermes come down to the earth for a brief time disguised as slaves to do some recon work so they can hear what people really think about them. After their investigation is completed, Zeus and Hermes throw off their disguise and reveal themselves in all their Olympian splendor. Their appearance as servants was just a disguise, not who they really were. There's a more modern-day version of Zeus and Hermes on television. It's a reality TV show titled Undercover Boss. And in that series, uh, owners of large companies or high-level corporate executives disguise themselves as everyday run-of-the-mill employees and work alongside of them in order to learn what they really think or believe about the business and about the company. But, like Zeus and Hermes, when the investigation is complete, the disguises are thrown away and they go back to their corner offices. When Jesus came in the form of a servant. He was not disguising who God really is. He was revealing who God really is. This was not a part-time gig for Jesus coming to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It was an eternal gig that can be traced back to creation itself. For all of human history, God has been washing feet. For all of human history, God has been helping people with their problems. For all of human history, God has been serving his creation because a servant is who God actually is. And that was on full display when Jesus gave his life as a ransom for many. Now, some critics might say, well, that was easy for him to do because he knew he would resurrect three days later. Question for you. Is it easy for you to always serve because you know one day you'll resurrect and live forever? When you get sick, do you say to the Lord, I'll carry this disease to my grave if you want because I'm ready to give my life over to you? Uh, when you're rejected or ridiculed, is it easy for you to say, Lord, I'm willing to look like a loser for the rest of my life if that's what you want for my life because I know I'll be resurrected one day. It's not so easy, is it? To consistently live as a servant and to give your life away for the benefit of others. Now, the oldest heresy related to Jesus is something called docetism. And it arose because people, boom, just could not believe that God would actually become a human being, serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So they created this doctrine, docetism, which simply says, 
It seemed like Jesus was a man. It seemed like he had a body. It seemed like he was serving all of the time, but he really, really wasn't. He really, really wasn't a human being who served everyone. Now, I bet most of you do not know that in ancient times, humility was not seen as a virtue. It's seen as a virtue most of the time today. But in ancient times, pride was a virtue. And humility was seen as weakness. And so people in ancient times had a hard time grasping how God in the flesh, Jesus, could be so humble all of the time, in spite of everything that Jesus told them. Now, there's this often overlooked phrase in Luke chapter 12, where Jesus is talking about his second coming, and he compares it to a master returning home where all of his servants are waiting. And this is what he says in verse 37. I tell you the truth, he, the master, will dress himself to serve, will have them, the servants, recline at the table and will come and wait on them. Do you see it? How mind-blowing it is? There's not a servant in that day like this who comes home and says to all of his servants, hey, you guys sit on the couch and recliner. I'm going to cook you a great meal. I'm going to serve you every bit of the way. Then I'm going to do up all of the cleaning afterwards. There's not a servant like that. But that is, that's not a master like that. But that is who Jesus is. He really has come to serve. And yet, like the disciples, uh, we don't get it all of the time either, do we? Sometimes God confuses us. Sometimes God frustrates and disappoints us. Sometimes we blame God for things happening around us or in us. And yet all of the while, while we're on our rants, God is always serving us. Because it's who he is all of the time. Now, James and John aren't the only ones who, who want to be served. When the other ten hear about their request, they're indignant. Not by their request, <coughs> but because they also want what James and John have asked for. In fact, in the preceding chapter, Mark chapter 9, all twelve were arguing about who was the greatest among themselves. And then, during the First Communion, they bring up that old argument and argue about who is the greatest among themselves. And that's the argument here in Mark chapter 10 as well. They were apparently trying to establish a, what we call today, a pecking order. Like who's on the top and who's on the bottom. Now that phrase, pecking order, came after uh, domestic hymns were observed. And what was observed was that when the animals were to eat, uh, the dominant would eat first and all the way down the line to the weakest. Now, to establish first rank, the hen would use his beak, right, to, to peck on other hens to get with the program and go down the ladder. Now, the apostles don't have beaks, but they did peck each other with their words in these arguments. You can only imagine what they said. Things like, well, that's healed a lot more sick people than you have. Or, I've known Jesus a lot longer than you have. Or, I'm more educated in the Torah than you are. Anything they could come up with to establish that one was greater than the other. <coughs> But the trouble with this conversation about who is greatest is what? It leads to a conversation about who is the least. And you can't, you can't have a conversation about who's number one without establishing who's number 12. And what I find sort of amusing about this scene in Scripture is this. 
there are 12 lords and only one servant present. There are 12 guys who want to be served and only one guy who has come to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus is the only one who's willing to lose so everyone else will win. Now, James and John do profess their willingness to serve Jesus. They say, yes, we'll drink the cup. If that cup in includes pain and suffering, we will do it with you, Jesus. And they say, yes, we'll be baptized with the baptism you were baptized with. It means immersion in problems and difficulties. We'll be right alongside you, Jesus. But who will they really be for? Not for Jesus, but for themselves. They will be serving Jesus in order to elevate themselves to the places in Jesus' kingdom they really want, the right and the left, sort of like co-vice presidents. So serving in order to advance your own agenda, serving in order to manipulate a situation doesn't make you a servant. It still makes you selfish. And at the core of every human being is a selfish heart. We're sort of born that way. And so we have the potential to turn acts of generosity, acts of kindness, <clears throat> really into acts of service to ourselves. My throat is running out of ammunition. <clears throat> so let me skip something. Let's just get to this. When Jesus says, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, I get really nervous because I can see them turning that into a competition. Like, I will serve and serve and serve so I can be seen as greater than you and you and you. And haven't we all done that? Served others to really serve ourselves? I've done that in my marriage. I've done that in church work, community work. Now when I clean the house and wash the floors, when Dinah gets home, I don't say, hey, I clean the house, I wash the floors. But in my younger days, I would say such a thing to say, Look at what all of I've done. Now, what are you going to do? My service is really about serving myself instead of serving her. And in church work, so people wouldn't look at me like I was a lazy bum, I would tell people the kind of things I've done in church work and how I served here and what I did there. I've got one. It's just not taking root, but bless your heart. Thank you. And by telling people how I was serving, I was really serving myself, not people. It's very hard to detect in our hearts whether or not we're really serving others or serving others to serve ourselves. So here's a few things to look for. You know your service to others is really about serving yourself when, number one, you require external rewards. Number two, you anticipate reciprocity, like I did this for you. You should do something for me. When you're overly concerned about results or if your service is affected by moods or whims, meaning if I don't feel like it, I don't do it. But if I feel like it, I'll serve. Then that service is really about you and not about others. So I'll close with a couple of things to give you to practice on this week. Two things to help you and I develop the heart of a servant. Number one is called the service of hiddenness. With the rise of social media, I gotta tell you, there are very few things hidden anymore. It's like we've forgotten how to live our lives without letting everybody else know 
how we are living our lives. And so we've lost this idea of hiddenness. I was at a Rotary uh, Leadership Conference several months ago, and they gave us all T-shirts. And the back of the T-shirt said, I'm a Rotarian, and I make a difference. Now, I know what they were trying to do. Most people don't have a clue about what Rotary members do and who they are. So it was a way of telling them that we're a service organization. I can't wear that T-shirt. It just feels like I'm saying, look at me, look at me, look at how I am making a difference in this world. Um, You've heard the term virtue signaling today. Some of you haven't. Same thing in the 9 o'clock service. That may be a good thing, actually. But it's a way in terms of social media, et cetera, we can say certain things as a way to signal to people, I'm a really good person because I'm against this or I'm for that. Um, Back in, I don't know how long it was, when the ALS ice uh, water bucket challenge took place, remember that? Where you dumped over your head a, a bucket of ice water. Did you know that most people who did that for everybody to see on social media didn't make a contribution to ALS research, which was the purpose of the challenge? It was like, look at me, look at me, but not actually serving the purpose it was designed for. So the service of hiddenness rebukes the flesh and does a a blow to pride Because we serve anonymously or serve without letting everybody else know how we've served. And that creates within us the heart of a true servant. The second practice is the ministry of bearing. Galatians 6.2 says, carry each other's burdens. Now, what that simply means is, if something's going on with you, I'm going to be there with you. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to help you where you will let me help you. You're not going to carry this alone. I'm going to carry it with you. But the ministry of bearing could also be holding our tongues. When like somebody says something we disagree with or don't like, instead of like just telling them how wrong they are, we hold our tongues. We bear with that person. Or we forgive that person. That's a way of bearing with a person. Or when somebody criticizes us, we don't start avoiding that person. That's the ministry of bearing. When Ruby Bridges was six years old, she was the first black student at Franz Elementary School in my hometown in New Orleans. And uh, every morning she was uh, ushered by FBI agents into that school as White protesters on both sides of her uh, cursed at her and screamed at her and yelled at her. One day, she actually stopped and turned to the crowd, and it looked like she was saying something to the crowd that really jacked that crowd up even louder and nastier, and FBI agents ushered her into the school. And the teacher said, you can't stop and talk to those people. And six-year-old Ruby said, I wasn't talking to them. I was talking to God. I always pray before I leave home, but I forgot. I remember just at that moment that I hadn't prayed, and so I stopped and I prayed. Now, she was working with a psychiatrist at the time in that school, and the psychiatrist asked, why would you want to pray for all of those people who are cussing at you and being so nasty towards you? Little Ruby said, well, don't you think they need prayer? And then she was asked, what were you praying? She was praying what her parents at home had taught her to pray, a prayer that that Jesus had similarly prayed when protesters all around him were cussing at him and insulting him. Ruby was praying, God, please forgive these people because they don't know what they're doing. That's the ministry of bearing, even bearing with people who are so against us. Our group's gonna come and lead us in a song that's 
written as a prayer from us to God. A song that helps us to develop the heart of a servant. To like Jesus, leave the building this morning. Not to be served by others, but to serve and give our lives as a ransom for many. If we can help you in this effort to follow Jesus and to have the heart of a servant by praying with you, encouraging you, or if you're ready, being baptized in the Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, meet me down front and tell us how we can help as together we stand and sing. Lord, make me a servant. Lord, make me like you. For you are a servant. Make me one too. Lord, make me a servant. Do what you must do. To make me a servant, make me like you. Lord, make me a servant, Lord, make me like you, for you. seated. We're going to sing one final song uh, this morning. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, and then our brother Wes is going to come and dismiss us. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah.
thank you, Jay, for that lesson. Um, thank you, Brent, for your meditation words. And thank you, Jason, for your commitment and your work to um, furthering his kingdom. Thank you to all you folks here today and those on Facebook. Real quick story, I got to know Jason a little bit last month. Um, Gina told me he was looking for some work to fund his trip to Mexico. And my family, like Brent's family, seems to always be working on something. And the maintenance we do is a lot of times more than Dustin and I can manage. So I had Jason help us prune a tree, a big live oak. And he had mentioned that he like to rock climb. I didn't pay it much attention, but I had an eight foot ladder and an eight foot pole saw to prune these limbs with, and I'm gassing up one of the saws, and I turn around, he's up the tree with a chainsaw. <laughs> <laughs> he just climbed right up there, and I think he enjoyed it, but uh, I enjoyed working <laughs> with him, and I uh, appreciate his help. Would you bow with me now, please? God, our Father, thank you so much for all the ways you bless us and look after us. I pray you'll watch over each of us as we go out among the world. We thank you for the words that were spoken here today and pray that you'll help us to uh, learn to live as you would have us to. We thank you for all those that make things happen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.